take a moment to think about what it's like when you're hanging out with your best friend. It's just the two of you. You're hanging out. What do you talk about? What's that conversation like? Uh, what's the, the style of conversation? How do you talk to each other and what kinds of tones and, and what are you wearing? What kind of facial expressions are you using? What kind of inside jokes do you have? Just all those things that, you know, those are unique when you have just you and your best friend and, and there's just this kind of vibe happening between you. Right. And then that vibe is still there and, and it's still a special relationship. But when you add in other people to that mix, even friends of yours, your close friends, your good friends as a group of friends, but that dynamic changes slightly, right? What you talk about, how you talk about it and the inside jokes that you have, it changes when you get into that group dynamic. There are other people to consider and think about. Think about some of our most famous friends, right? From the show friends exponentially, uh, Joey and Chandler were dumber when it was just the two of them, right? Did more stupid things when they were together and acted differently when it was just the two of them than they did when it was the larger group of friends, when they were all together. And the same is true for any other pair. Right? You look at them and, and most of the shenanigans they got into had to do with two people because they were acting differently when it was just the two of them than they were in the larger group. There are different considerations and different dynamics that exist when we're in a group situation. And so that's why we think of group communication as different than other types of communication. It's different than interpersonal communication or intrapersonal communication or public speaking or mass communication. It has different rules, different considerations and different things we need to be aware of if we're going to be effective in a group environment and communicating in that environment. So in this video, we're going to start our series by talking about the characteristics of small groups, what is it that makes them unique and what is it that sets them apart from other types of communication uh, scenarios and communication forms? So let's start off by defining what it is we mean when we say small group. A small group involves interactions among three or more people who are connected through a common purpose, a mutual influence and a shared identity. All of these elements are important. If you don't have all of these elements together, then we're not really talking about a small group in the sense that we're talking about it. We're going to be focusing mostly on um, task oriented uh, problem solving groups and things. These things certainly apply to friendship groups and, and situations like that as well. But our focus is going to be mostly on work related problem solving type groups, task oriented groups. So we're talking though at a minimum, you got to have three people as we'll talk about and that you can have more and we'll kind of establish those guidelines. But those are, you know, it's got to be between three and something amount of people. They're connected, though, between this common purpose, mutual influence and shared identity. And we'll talk about each of these things here in a second. So again, the characteristics of a small group that we want to talk about first involve size. Let's establish some things about size. First of all, for a small group, you have to have at least three people. If there's less than that, it's not what we would consider a group. Again, two people would be interpersonal. One person will be intrapersonal. And there are different dynamics for public speaking and mass communication. Three people, at least three people are involved in a group. Now you can have more than that. Of course, you can have a larger group than three people. You can go all the way up to some people would say, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 people. Um, but, and that would be, that would be fine. There's no agreed upon maximum size. It can grow though, beyond three people, obviously. And when you get too many people though, too big a group is a problem. Uh, it, it exponentially adds more connections that you have to be concerned about between group members. Uh, members can then, and too large a group can feel overwhelmed or disconnected from the group. Individual members can feel that. And, and, and you start to see groups form within a group. And that's when we, that's what we would call an organization. Then an organization is groups within a group really. And, and they, these groups though, start to develop different a sense of purpose and different identities and so forth. And they're not really one cohesive group as much when you get too big. So too big is a problem. Really the ideal group size is it considers what is necessary and what is functional. So when you get too big, um, you, you may add more people than you need to get the job done. You really, for uh, the ideal group size involves however many people you need in order to do the job that you're trying to do or solve the task solve the problem or complete the task that you're trying to complete. That's how many people you need in that group. And then what is functional? If the group gets so big that you can't really communicate with one another, or that it's, that it's veering off in different directions within these subgroups, then that's not functional anymore. You can't really control it. So then the group starts to lose effectiveness. So the ideal group size, there's no exact number other than it has to be at least three. And you don't want to get so big that you, that you had on what is unnecessary and what is not functional anymore. 
Another element or characteristic of small groups that we need to consider is structure and the way that groups are affected by that structure and the elements that go into that. So uh, we look at a couple of different things in terms of structure. First, we look at internal versus external um, influences and factors and functions. And so the structure of a group is affected by the internal dynamics of that group. So you have a leader that emerges or you have, you know, a, a group, a block of people that's influential and, but within the group that are working within the group or some different dynamics within the group that really influence the way that group operates. That's, that's, those are internal influences and factors that we need to consider. But then there are also external ones. Maybe if your group is part of a larger organization, if you're at a, if you're part of a group at work, you're part of that larger company, uh, or, or you're at a nonprofit, you're part of that larger organization, your group working within that structure. So you have those external factors to consider things that are going on there, or maybe you have, uh, clients or a public or customers or whatever that you're trying to consider. So those are external factors as well. So we are, the group is affected both structurally internally and externally by these, these factors and influences. We also have to think about formal and informal networks and the, the role that they can play in group structure. So, you know, formal networks are those that are, that are firmly established, either, you know, written or unwritten, but, but firmly established. Again, if you're part of a larger organization, there may be a hierarchy uh, within that organization. There may be even a hierarchy within the group. If it's a formal type of group like that, where you have these very clear lines of communication and, and report and power structures and things, those are formal. Those are uh, identified. Those are recognized, but then there are also maybe these informal networks of communication where somebody knows somebody, you know, you're trying to do something as a group and, and you're putting on this event and you, you have a buddy who has a PA system, who has a sound system and does some DJing. So you, you, you know, it's not part of your formal network as part of this group, but you say, look, I can get a, a PA system for cheap or for free because my buddy has one and I can ask him to do me a favor. And those are informal networks. So you have those at work as well. You have the, in the, within a group, formal and informal networks that are part of that structure and things that we've got to keep tabs on and, and be aware of. Another characteristic of small groups is that there exists what we call interdependence, interdependence or this interconnectedness among the different aspects of the group. Think of it like when you, when you throw a stone in a pond or something falls in a, in a calm body of water and it makes those ripples extend from there, right? Everything in that pond is connected and affected by those ripples. Then that ecosystem is affected by what's going on in one part of it. And, uh, and even though it's not directly involved, it's going to affect other things things. Another way to, to look at or to think about interdependence, interdependence is if you're playing Jenga, you know, this is the huge size Jenga with the blocks, but if you're playing big gen, big Jenga, regular Jenga, whatever, when you move one of those blocks, it affects obviously that tower. It affects you. It affects what you're doing. And, and, uh, it, you know, you're trying to be careful not to knock that tower over, but it also affects everybody else, right? That impacts the, 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 the block that I pull out affects which block you're going to pull out and how you're going to play the game and, and, uh, and you know, the chances that you have of success and the way you do your work. Right? So there's this interconnectedness in a group as well, that what one person does in that group affects everybody else. When one person is late to a meeting that affects everybody else. It holds everybody else up. When one person's not doing their work effectively, it affects everybody else. When one person is going gangbusters and really knocking it out of the park that affects everybody else in a positive way. So it works all together, right? But what, what happens with one person affects those others in the group that's interdependence. Uh, you don't have that outside of that group. If I'm walking down the sidewalk and I trip and fall, it doesn't affect about unless I fall into somebody, right? But if you're just walking along the other side of the street, it doesn't really affect you. Um, we're not interdependent in that way. But when something happens to someone within a group, or some, you know, any action you take within a group is going to have an effect on everybody else in that group. And we need to be aware of that. And as a characteristic of a small group, small groups, as we, as we mentioned in our definition, also have this shared identity. They develop a shared identity, um, you know, something that, that connects them and, and uh, pushes them forward as well and, and draws them closer together. So I happen to be a huge fan of the University of Michigan. I love the University of Michigan uh, sports. I did not attend the University of Michigan. People always ask, no, I didn't go to Michigan, but I grew up a huge fan uh, and, uh, and go blue, right? And all that. So, and those are things that I have a shared identity. When I see a stranger and I'm, I'm frequently walking around with a Michigan sweatshirt or hat or something on, and it drives my wife nuts because she's not a Michigan fan, but because almost everywhere we go, somebody's going to holler out just out of the blue, go blue. 
and I'm going to holler back, go blue, right? Go blue. That's a shared identity that we have as Michigan fans and, and you know, people with different sports affiliations will have that. You'll, you'll see somebody wearing a sweatshirt or hat of your team or whatever. And, and you'll holler out something to them because you have that shared identity, complete strangers. You have that shared identity with them and, and fans of a, a particular group um, will have that. Groups will develop that as well. That not, not necessarily slogans or whatever, although it could take that, but these shared histories and shared stories and shared goals. And, and they just develop the shared identity uh, with one another in effective groups. That's a characteristic of a small group that, that happens. Um, really divides us into what we would call in groups and out groups, right? In groups are just people who are within that group. Who anybody who's within, you know, Michigan fans are in my in group. We're all in an in group together. Uh, other fans are, you know, fans of different teams are in they are the in the out group. They're in their own in group if they have another team. But the, for, from my perspective, they're in the out group. Uh, and groups about that as well. You have this, this shorthand and these inside references and jokes and whatever these connections that you have within your group when you're in group that won't make sense to people or, or affect people in the same way if they are part of the out group because groups develop these shared identities. So now we have a better idea of what we're talking about when we say, what is a small group, right? What is a small group? Well, now we've defined it a little bit. Okay? We've got to have three or more people. We've got to have that shared purpose, that mutual identity, and, and you know, just be driving forward together. So in future videos, then we're going to take a look at some of the other elements and considerations for small group and how we can be more effective within those groups. If you have questions about any of those small groups or anything related to, to working in small groups and communication within small groups, Please feel free to email me. I'd be happy to chat with you there. In the meantime, I hope this has given us a solid foundation to start from as we begin our exploration of communicating effectively in small groups.